Hey, good morning. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Jose, for uh, being here. Thanks to the society. And uh, let's see here. Cool. I have nothing to disclose other than I've caused a fair amount of bleeding. So, uh, and that's not surprising because bleeding is probably the most common complication that you'll have following polypectomy. And overall, it'll happen in about one out of six, uh, one to six out of every 1,000 colonoscopies, which is pretty low and pretty rare, but if you think about the number of polypectomies that are done, it can actually occur up into about 1% of polypectomies. Now, how you define hemorrhage is pretty variable when you look at the literature. So an immediate hemorrhage is considered anything during the procedure within the first day, and most people define a delayed hemorrhage as anything that happens beyond one day. I think we understand how an immediate hemorrhage happens. We cut something and it bleeds. But the delayed hemorrhage is thought to arise from a local tissue, tissue ischemia, necrosis, inflammation, an eschar that will slough off and will uh, leave you with, um, leave you with uh, a wound that will continue to bleed. And that can really happen anyway between 1 and 14 days. So given the rare, F, that's the rare incidence of this, it's important to, uh, to look at population-based studies to get a true sense of just how often this is happening and why. So this is a great study from uh, France that looked at nearly a million colonoscopies, of which about a third of them underwent a polypectomy, causing about 1,000 bleeds. And interestingly, most of these bleeds, 88% of them occurred within the first day. But as you can see, the risk factors, uh, being a male patient, having an endoscopist uh, who had less than uh, 10 years since their graduation, having a patient with a chronic medical condition, or a patient who underwent excision of, or a polypectomy of a polyp greater than one centimeter in diameter, or multiple centimeters, or multiple polyps uh, were risk factors for bleeding. And when the authors further looked at age, you can see here that if you're greater than 80 years old, you are three times more likely to have a bleed, and it followed a pretty linear trend. This study from South Korea looked at nearly 6,000 polyps that were removed from 16,000 patients that caused 42 cases of bleeding. And as you can see, they identified that right-sided polyps, whereas, as Dr. Lipinska had mentioned, that uh, right-sided colon is very thin. Polyps, again, that were greater than 10 millimeters in diameter. And again, that magic number of 300 endoscopies was a risk factor for bleeding. This is a study from China looking at 15,000 uh, polypectomies and nearly 6,000 patients. The interesting thing with this is that they provided time course status. You can see the most polypectomy bleeds occur between two to six days with a peak incident somewhere between your third and fourth day. So it's not always while you're in the endoscopy suite. It's usually these are patients who come back after their bleed. But look how late they, these uh, trend. So you did most, there's significant bleeding that can actually occur up to 14 days after the procedure. So we know that there's clearly polyp factors. We know that there's clearly uh, uh, polyp factors that, that, that cause bleeding, but there's also patient factors. So these are uh, a couple of good studies looking at a uh, large series of bleeding patients. As you can see, patients who, who are older, greater than 65, and then patients with comorbidities, such like card cardiovascular disease, renal disease, diabetes, and lung disease, all at increased risks of having uh, post-polypectomy hemorrhage. So there are certain things that the polyp will bring to the equation that you can't fix. There are certain things that the patient will bring to the equation that you can't fix. But there are some modifiable factors that you can do as an endoscopist. And you can better modulate your medications and get your patients in better state heading into their procedure. So I don't think it's a surprise to anyone in the audience that warfarin and the newer generation, the, the novel oral anticoagulants or, no, or NOACs, are at an increased risk for causing post-polypectomy hemorrhage. But I think it's important to note that aspirin is not. So aspirin is a safe procedure that you can do just about any endoscopic procedure on. Now, even Plavix, when you actually look at large data series, Plavix is relatively safe to do most polypectomies on. Even the biggest uh, EMRs can be done with Plavix. It's not until you have dual antiplatelet therapy, so that would be clopidogrel, Plavix, and aspirin or another NSAID that you run into increased risks of bleeding. So having a firm understanding of this can get your patients in a better shape. Now, we don't have enough time to go over this, but I would direct anyone, this is the 2016 ASGE reference on how to handle periprocedural antithrombotics. So it talks about antiplatelet agents as well as systemic anticoagulation. It is a great read. It's uh, 12 pages long, but it boils down to this table. Patients are stratified as being either high cardiovascular risk or low cardiovascular risk, and then the endoscopic procedures are stratified as low risk or high risk. Now, with regard to colonoscopy, it's pretty straightforward. Any colonoscopy, even with mucosal biopsies, is low risk. Any polypectomy is considered high risk. Any legitimate polypectomy, not talking about taking out two millimeter things, but ESD, uh, EMR, and large polypectomies. And you stratify your patients based on this, and it gives pretty discrete information on how to handle these patients. So. Uh, to summarize this, there's really no one size fits all, so it is highly individualized, and you have to look at you know, how you de determine if a patient's high risk or low risk of the procedure um, is a little bit tricky. But here's some hints. 
Aspirin is okay for everything. Warfarin can almost always be resumed the same day of the procedure, even if it's a big polypectomy. Low molecular weight heparin bridging, this is something I think we're used to doing as surgeons where someone is on warfarin and we have them stop it and we give them full dose Lovenox and we stop that one day for the, for the procedure and resume it right after. It's actually been shown for average risk patients and low risk patients to increase your risk of post-procedural bleeding. So you're probably much better off letting these patients just naturally let their Coumadin wear off five to seven days before the procedure and resuming it right after the procedure and letting them come up than you are about bridging. Don't stop all plant antiplatelet agents after a stent, regardless of the stent's age. Since we know that aspirin is safe, it's okay to continue aspirin for someone who's got either a, a bare metal or, or drug-eluting stent. And if someone is on dual antiplatelet therapy, and there, if it's a stent that's greater than 24 months old, you can switch them to, Plavix or to aspirin alone. If they're high risk, you can do it on Plavix. Um, it, there are a couple of black box indications. Uh, any new stent that's less than 30 days needs to be on Plavix. So the, the rate of in-stent thrombosis is exceedingly high, so that you cannot stop. And also something I think we often overlook as surgeons and endoscopists is can you simply delay the procedure? You know, sometimes people are on three to six months of anticoagulation following, say, a cardioversion. You know, can you delay the procedure until after they're off the anticoagulation, then do it? That's an easy way to avoid your risk. If you're like me, uh, you can't keep these medicines straight. These are our new enemies, the NOAX, Perdaxa, Eloquis, Xarelto. Uh, if you look at them, some of the half-lives and the actual bleeding efficacy are several days. So this reference gives a great, um, a great tables that I actually keep this on my iPhone for the middle of the night when I get called to operate on someone in Pradaxa, so I have a rough idea of when they took, last took their dose and when I need to do. So we know that there's patient factors, we know that there's medication factors, there's polyp factors. Well, what about the technical factors? Does that imp have implications on polypectomy bleeding? Absolutely. So I'll point out a couple studies. This was uh, by Pespadis et al. in 2011, who took patients with small polyps, small sessile polyps, three to eight millimeters, and randomized them to hot snare polypectomy versus cold snare polypectomy. Now, if you're a surgeon like me, cautery is what we use for everything. But interestingly, they show that you can see in the cold snare group in the column on the left, there was a higher rate of in-procedural bleeding, 9% versus 1%. So adding cautery during your polypectomy during the procedure actually lowered the amount of bleeding that you had while you were doing it. But that bleeding stopped in every single case. That bleeding stopped in every single case before the procedure was complete. And if you looked at an early postoperative uh, bleeding and late postoperative bleeding, there was no difference. So the addition of cautery to your polypectomy actually doesn't do much for you. And look at this. It adds time to your procedure. So the average amount of time was actually seven minutes longer for a hot snare than a cold snare. That's something I didn't really appreciate. You know, we think about using hot snare, we can do it pretty quick, but it actually does take a lot longer. So this was followed up with a smaller study, but of certainly a more potent study. Uh, Haruchi et al. in 2014 took patients with up to 10 millimeter sessile polyps who were fully anticoagulated. So they did these polypectomies with an average or mean INR of 2.3. And they randomized patients to hot snare versus cold snare. And interestingly and paradoxically, patients who had hot snare polypectomy, the column on the right, had higher risks of bleeding both immediately and late term. 46% of patients who went hot snare polypectomy who are fully anticoagulated had much higher bleeding risk than compared to cold snare. So this, you know, surgeons were used to thinking about cautery. Sometimes cautery is, is a worse thing than using cold snare. And again, this took about 10 minutes longer. So what can you do to prophylax against bleeding? Well, I mean, you have all the things you have in your surgical toolbox. There's thermal energy, there's injectables, and in the mechanical adjuncts, clips, detachable snares, and using combinations thereof. So kind of to go over the one at a time. So thermal energy, does doing additional cautery at the time of your polypectomy make a difference? No, and I just said it's polyp the cautery actually causes a larger burn, it causes a larger area of, of tissue necrosis that sloughs and bleeds later on. So you actually you're better off not doing cautery if you can do it for relatively small polyps. And even fancy things like argon plasma uh, coagulation does not make a difference. It causes a big burn and that burn goes on to bleed. So there's really not much of a role for using preventative cautery. Now, if you need to do cautery during a polypectomy just because you're having bad bleeding, treat it, that's fine. But giving it additional little zaps to make sure it doesn't bleed isn't going to get you uh, anywhere further. Injectables. I think there's very good data that shows that the addition of epinephrine to saline during endoscopic mucosal resection causes additional vasoconstriction in the submucosal layer and decreases immediate bleeding by about 60%. So again, immediate bleeding during the procedure. It doesn't do anything for late-term bleeding, but it helps make it a less bloody procedure for big polypectomies. There's a lot of talk about using other injectable agents. There's uh, hypertonic saline. There's uh, people are using albumin, dextrose. Uh, no, uh, no implications on bleeding whatsoever. Maybe an easier polypectomy, but no one's quite sure about the effect of bleeding. 
And what about clips? You know, this was very contentious. And if you think about how many clips it can take to close a defect, they're about $150 each. One study I looked at, one VA, uh, their, their budget for clips for prophylactic closure was over $100,000 a year, just prophylactic clips. But there's actually some good data that shows that it works. But the catch here is that it needs to be a large polyp. I'll point out this one prospective randomized trial by Zhang et al. in 2015. They took polyps that are undergoing endoscopic mucosal resection one to four centimeters, so pretty big polyps. 174, they clipped, 174, they didn't clip, and the bleeding rate dropped from 7% down to less than 1% by just doing prophylactic clipping. This was contentious, depending on the literature that you pull. Uh, some people maybe saw a difference, some people didn't. There's a lot of cost value analysis, but I think this is a great study that shows that for larger polyps, I think it's the way to go. Now that's for sessile polyps. What about pedunculated polyps? Typically, most of the larger polyps are gonna be sessile, but on occasion, you'll see a large pedunculated polyp, and there's good data that shows that an endo loop, or a detachable snare, is good for reducing bleeding. So I'll point out this one study by DiGiorgio et al. in 2004 that looked at polyps that were pedunculated with a greater than two centimeter head using an endo loop with a hot snare or a detachable snare at the base, decreased the risk of bleeding from about 15% down to 3% just by using the snare at that base to basically like we would as a surgeon to suture ligate that base. Interestingly, when they looked at this for smaller polyps that were less than two centimeters, no difference. So the benefit, again, for prophylactic mechanical adjunct seems to be limited to larger polyps. There's also combination therapy, and there's a lot of people talking about, well, maybe we can do clipping, we can do you know, multiple things. It doesn't do any difference for immediate bleeding and doesn't have any impact on late-term bleeding. So pick one thing, do it well, but putting multiple adjuncts together uh, doesn't help you out. So what do we do when we run into bleeding? Well, I, you know, immediate bleeding, while well, you're doing a procedure, um, no, not surprisingly, correlates with the late-term bleeding. It's that late-term bleeding, really, that we want to fix because that's when the patient has to come back into the hospital, be readmitted, possibly get transfused or require an intervention. So it's the late-term bleeding that, we're, that we care about. So you treat it early and aggressively. So if you have a polyp that's bleeding, you don't leave the endoscopy suite until it's fixed. Use all the adjuncts that you have in your tool box. Now, the nuance of this is when you have to handle the delay bleed. And this is where the management's based, of course, on hemodynamic stability. If you have an unstable patient, you, have, you need to do something. And look at the response to resuscitation. And I like to introduce this term, I call it bleeding acceleration. So there's some non-clinical cues that you can get looking at the patient. Look at the frequency, the volume, the characteristics of the blood. Although not highly scientific, this is more the, sci the art of surgery than the science of surgery. But you get a sense if the patient is, bleed is getting worse, getting better, or staying the same. Also, too, think about you know, a few steps down the road. What does this patient's need for anticoagulation after the bleed? So is this someone on a left ventricular assist device who has to go on systemic anticoagulation? That would be someone I'd intervene upon sooner rather than someone I can take my time and wait. So what do we do when we run into bleeding? So for a hemodynamically stable patient, you smoke a long cigar. This will get better, it stops on its own, it makes you nervous, it makes the patient nervous, it makes the nurses nervous, but most of the time this will stop and not require an intervention. I tell our residents, correct the correctables. If you have a coagulopathic patient, fix it. If you have a patient who's on NSAIDs or anticoagulation, you can hold it, fix it. Time fixes most problems. If that doesn't work, you have a variety of endoscopic adjuncts that will go over. If that doesn't work, you can take the rare patient down to angiography, and heaven forbid, if that doesn't work, you're a surgeon, you can always take the patient to surgery. So just a couple technical events. If you're taking someone back to the OR for a, a bleeding polypectomy site, uh, there's a lot of debate about, you know, do you need a bowel prep? Do you, is it helpful? Is it not? I think it kind of depends on the individual circumstance. If you know, if you only took out one polyp and they're less back in a few days, that's probably what's bleeding. I doubt that they have a de novo GI bleed. Usually, if you know where it is, you may not necessarily need to do a bowel prep, but if there's a lot of blood that's in the field, it may be very, very challenging. Also, too, if you did multiple polypectomies that are large, you may not be sure which one is bleeding. So... Um, I think the overriding factor in this decision is, do you, is the patient stable enough to tolerate a bowel prep or not, or do you have to do something urgently or emergently? If you are going to do something, think about your mechanical needs. So think about your endoscope. Um, make sure you have a power irrigator that's available. Consider your suction channel diameter. You know, sometimes the colon is filled with big, viscous clot that you just can't get out. So then you would consider about having a therapeutic scope or a larger suction diameter. And make sure you have all your toys together before you do the procedure. So make sure that you have your energy device working. Make sure your nurse knows how the energy device works. Make sure you have your clips. Make sure you have your injectables. Be ready to deal with everything. Have your toolbox ready to go. Think a few steps ahead as well. Think about who's going to be taking care of the patient while you're doing the intervention. It's really, really nice to take the patient to the OR, and we as surgeons usually have this ability because then you have an anesthesiologist who can deal with IVs, deal with resuscitation, give the patient the product, take care of that while you're taking care of the bleeding. If you can't fix it endoscopically, leave a clip. Why do you leave a clip? So you can find it during the angiography. And also tattoo it. Why do you tattoo it? Because heaven forbid, if you can't deal with the angiography, 
Now you know the segment that's actually bleeding rather than dealing with a blind segment. Angioembolization, I think we're familiar for using this for GI bleeding. There's no case series about what to do for post polypectomy bleeding. There's various and sundry case reports that talk about using this. If you are going to use it, there's two different routes you can do. One is the uh, interventional uh, uh, radiology team can leave a catheter in the selected uh, artery, and they can run a low-dose vasopressin infusion that causes a transient uh, vasoconstriction and usually stops the bleeding. Or they could do a super selective angioembolization of the bleeding, the bleeding uh, vessel. Uh, the trick here is you have to tell them it needs to be distal to the marginal artery of Drummond. If it's proximal to that, they'll take out the segment of colon. So you don't want them to take out the IMA, you want them to take out the little bleeder that's feeding the thing. So you have to talk with your radiologist. Uh, we've taken out left colons because of one tiny little bleeder because I say, oh, you told us to take out the, you know, stop the bleeding. Well, I didn't want you to take out the whole IMA. Something to keep about. Now, and if, Lastly, you know, heaven forbid, we're surgeons. I've never had to do this. This usually stops on its own, but I've thought about this often. What are we going to do if we have bleeding? You really have two options if you have to take the patient to the OR and they fail everything else. You can resect or you can over -sew. I think over -sewing sounds simple. That's all you need is a stitch in there. I think you will find that it's a lot harder to find this bleeding spot than you think, especially if it's not tattooed. And also think about making a colotomy by a pretty large thermal injury. Usually it's a snare polypectomy, usually a larger polyp. Now you have a, have a colotomy that needs to heal, and it's usually inflamed tissue from the cautery. So it may not be as straightforward as you think. And also a little bit to talk about the perforation in Dr. Lipinska's talk. Um, think about why was that polyp taken out? Was the polyp taken out adequately? And by the way, do you have any histology on that polyp? Because if you find out that it was a cancer or you had a positive margin, you may be forced to do a resection anyway. So this is one thing in the few times I've had to deal with a colonoscopic complication and take the patient to the OR emergently. I'm on the phone with the pathologist, sometimes even in the middle of the night, to try to get a read on like, hey, by the way, is there any cancer? Or I speak with the endoscopist if it wasn't me who did the procedure to get a sense like, hey, did you get this polyp out or are you worried about something? So to summarize, post-polypectomy hemorrhage is the most common complication you'll see following polypectomy. It can last up to two weeks. So you're not out of the window once you're out of the endoscopy suite. We, I think we discussed the polyp, uh, the patient, and the technical risk factors and medication modulation. Know your enemies. Know the medications. Get your patients in the best shape. Know the rules for the anticoagulants and antithrombotic agents. Cold snare polypectomy works for most snares, uh, for most polyps up to, to 10 millimeters that are sessile. And prophylactic techniques are good for bigger polyps, both pedunculated and sessile. And all bleeding usually stops one way or the other. But if that doesn't happen, be prepared to do your endo endoscopic salvage. Angiography and surgery are almost rarely to never needed. So with that, I look forward to the discussion session, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk.